Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Road to Psychology podcast, episode two. Today's episode focuses on counselling psychology, and our guest today is Dr. Patricia Barber. In this episode, Dr. Barber covers the practicalities of becoming a counselling psychologist, self-care when working in a caring profession, and importantly, the difference between counselling psychology and other similar professions. I'd like to thank Dr. Barber for her time and the excellent advice she provided in this interview. I really enjoyed our conversation. I'd also like to thank everyone who got in contact over the last week with questions or just support for the podcast. It really means a lot. I really hope you enjoy episode two. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Patricia Barber, alumni of Glasgow Caledonian University and counselling psychologist. So thanks so much, Patricia, for coming on today. You're welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Um, So I suppose to start off, can you tell us about your road to getting into the doctorate? Sure. Um, In some ways it feels like it was a bit complicated, but in the grand scheme of things it probably wasn't. Um, I suppose from the very start I always knew that I wanted to do psychology um, from a really young age. Um, I probably was one of those lucky ones who had a good idea what I wanted to do, um, so I was able to kind of follow that. Um, So as early as whenever I was doing my A-levels in school, so I went to school in Northern Ireland, um, so I did psychology as an A-level there. which gave me a good kind of uh, indicator that I liked it and was going to continue it. Um, then I went to NUIG uh, Galway to do my psychology degree and again really enjoyed it. Knew that that was the right path but um, like a lot of people I think after you do your psychology degree you, you can sometimes not really know what to do next um, and the, the path is just not clear, it's not straightforward. Um, so I made the decision to take some time out. Um, to have a think about what I wanted to do. I had considered at one stage applying, I think I might even have applied, it's that long ago now, I can't remember, um, to do the Applied Behaviour Analysis Masters in Galway. Um, and I think, if I remember right, I think I got accepted and, and I almost accepted the the, the, um, the place on the course. And then I had a moment where I thought, I'm not really sure if that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took some time out. I took two years out between my um, degree and going to do the, the doctorate. Um, and in that time, I did a lot of kind of volunteering or work with, I worked quite closely with a, um, an organisation at home who offered a lot of counselling. Um, and I really felt that actually that's, that, that seemed interesting to me. That's what I wanted to do. But I was mindful that I'd already invested a lot of time and money into my psychology degree and I didn't want that to go to waste. Um, and I'll be honest, at that stage, I hadn't even heard of counselling psychology. It wasn't something that was mentioned at all when I was at Galway. Um, it wasn't anything that I was aware of as being um, very well known in Ireland. Um, And I think I looked at a number of different courses in Ireland and in the UK. um, And eventually I came across, uh, I think initially I came across a master's in counselling psychology first. And I thought, you know, this sounds interesting. Um, It's the counselling that I would like to do, but it doesn't ignore that I've already got a psychology degree. Um, And I looked at the course in Glasgow and then I thought, actually, do you know what, this is definitely this is this is what I what, what I want to do. Um, so I applied to the doctorate. Um, I didn't anticipate that I would be accepted at all. But what I thought I would do, like most people, is apply. And if you get rejected, they'll tell you this is what you could do. This is where things would go. So the application yeah, process it's was, almost like an urban myth. You know, you hear people that got straight from the degree into a doctorate. Yeah. You're like, you don't need this. So I think I think I might even have contacted them and kind of said, you know, this is the experience that I have. And they sort of said, well, you might not, but you might get feedback that will give you a good indicator of where to go next. Um, so I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first thing that I did was applied and then I had to, to write an essay, I think. Um, and I'll rem- I remember very clearly I was getting on a plane to go to Canada for two weeks to see my brother. Um, and just as I was getting on the plane, I got an email to say, you've got an essay to write and you've got something like three days to turn it around. <laughs> um, so I completed the essay and then I had a telephone interview um, because I was in Ireland and then I got accepted um, and it was a very quick turnaround and a very, it was almost a shock to the system in some, way, in some ways. Um, but that, that's how I got on to the doctorate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suppose in terms of my, my, my classmates and my peers, there was a range on the doctorate. So some people had, like myself, um, or some people had come straight from their psychology um, degree. They hadn't taken any you know, time in between. 
some people had done a master's in um, a range of different, some people had done a health psychology master's, some people had done, um, in Scotland there is a, a COSCA course, a certificate in counselling skills um, course, some people had done that, other people have had previous careers and then had applied, so a real range in terms of who was, who was accepted, um, but I think one of the things that they looked for more than anything was sort of um, life experience rather than uh, you know, you're just a psychology degree, um, but that's that's how I got to to be on. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about your how the course actually was? Because sure. I think a lot of people you can look at like a website and it tells you the modules and things, but like on a practical level, like what yeah. was the course actually yeah. like and what were your placements like and things. So one thing I will say is that um, the structure of the course has changed slightly since I since I completed it. Um, when I did it, it was just pure pure counselling psychology. Now uh, my understanding is that there's an element of classes that are combined with the health psychology doctorate and the sports psychology doctorate. Um, so there's a number of joint classes, and then you know each kind of specialty has their own classes. Um, in terms of kind of just a very practical thing, the course in the is, is spread out over three years if you do it full time, um, or seven years if you do it. No, sorry, three years if you do it full time and seven years if you do it part time. Um, and the first year is um, person centered um, modality, the second year is cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, and the third year then is um, much more about how you integrate those in your practice. And perhaps um, we would have had input in terms of um, ACT, DBT, um, but we would tend to say that we're kind of informed by those therapies rather than having had a block of teaching in them um schema therapy family therapy you know a real range um actually in terms of the the, the teaching and things like that so in stage one if i can remember this right now in stage one you have two days of teaching a week um and then each year you have two intensive weeks so a week long teaching monday to friday um outside of that then there's the expectation that you're on placement two days a week um so the course has a requirement that you have to achieve 450 hours of therapy um, by the end in order to sit your viva. Okay. Um, so usually that would be two days placement. Um, the placements are not, um, the course don't give you placements, you go find your own placements. Wow. Yeah. Um, so there's a challenge in that. Um, I find it particularly challenging because I had moved to a new city, you know, I'm on my house wasn't familiar with Glasgow at all, didn't know any organisations. If it's something that I had done at home, then I would have had, um, you know, places that I volunteered yeah. and things, connections, just in, in, and things like that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And, and, and it is challenging, particularly in that early stage, to get your first placement. And I think I, I struggled to get my first placement. I think it might have been even... So you do, um, in the first um, semester, you do um, sort of skills practice. So the teaching is was sort of split into on a Thursday you would have teaching in the morning and on a Thursday afternoon you would have your skills practice where you'd be broken into triads um, and and um, basically um, practice on each other. <laughs> <laughs> and would they be like your genuine life issues or are you oh, making yeah, the yeah, wrong yeah, way? Encouraged to bring your own, uh, you know, something that you felt safe enough to talk about, but that also was going on on for you. Um, and that was with two um, of your peers. So one was your therapist, the other one was observing, and then you would have feedback and the lecturers would sit in on that. Um, and then you would have an, an opportunity to, to be um, the psychologist for somebody else. Um, it was very challenging. And I think uh, from speaking to other people, they maybe didn't anticipate that element of it, you know. And um, we knew that there was an expectation in counseling psychology for you to have your own personal therapy. Um, but it's still quite different to have that with your your colleagues you know yeah. um then on your friday then it was it was all teaching um and very much like the theory um and things like that um and going back to the placements and things there's no as i said the university kind of have a list of you know this is where people would typically do placements um but they don't say they don't allocate you to placements um, would you like in a way kind of tailor your own doctor by picking your placements say if you chose adolescence you yeah. come out with a focus on adolescence at the end is that absolutely kind of so the, the i think that's one of to me one of the the benefits of, of, of the course was that you could tailor it um you know even though we all came out with a doctorate we all came out with very different um sort of experiences the actual teaching and the course is predominantly geared towards adult mm -hmm. um psychology um i actually have a bit of an interest in working with children and young people so i did a lot of placements 
um, there, but it wouldn't typically be the norm. And they would, you know, so um, in some ways, I maybe give myself a bit of extra work because I wanted the experience of having those placements. So I, I did them. But in terms of for your coursework, it always had to be an adult that you were using if you were doing a case study or something like that. Or yeah. um, the majority of your 450 hours um, that you use to qualify at the end had to come from adults, not from. Okay. Oh. Um, but you are qualified at the end of the doctor to work with adolescents and everything. You're, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free to, that's great. Because yeah. that was one of the questions that came in was um, if your experience was just with children or adolescents prior to it, would that be a disadvantage to get on the doctorate? I don't think so because it's the same. Um, it's the same skills. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's slightly different, but it's you're still using the same skills. So to me, it would be. It certainly wouldn't disadvantage you. Um, you know, uh, and and I know for my a lot of people um, in the in the cohort, their first placement was with children and young people, um, and especially in that kind of person centred year, it's quite good. You know, yeah. um, but you can. There's a range of there was a range of placements that I did. Um, I had an NHS placement in my th stage three. I had. I'll just see. In my stage one, I had a placement in a higher education college. Then I got a placement in uh, a third sector organization who provided short term therapy, so four sessions. Um, I also then worked in a school. Um, and then I had an occupational health placement in the NHS. And uh, I, because I have my interest in working with young people and families, um, I took a placement on in stage three in a children's contact center. Um, so that was a centre for children whose parents had separated um, and they weren't able to agree sort of custody arrangements themselves. So the courts um, are, uh, kind of arranged it um, and often there would be difficulties in, in making the contact happen. So uh, that was much more of a family um, systemic placement. Um, but again, that was because that's something that I was interested in. Yeah. So it allowed me to tailor it to that. Um, how difficult was the course would you say like I have a friend doing a PhD at the moment she went from the degree into the PhD and she was like it's a massive jump you know like academically yeah, it's and uh, stressed about it I suppose it's it's uh, I would say I was in a bubble for three years doing doing the course um and I think my friends and family would probably agree with that um you eat breathe uh, sleep psychology and and the course and it it is a difficult uh, any doctorate is, is it's difficult um Particularly, I think a counselling psychology doctorate is perhaps difficult because so much of the so much of the teaching or the input is about considering you as a person and how you impact on what happens um, in the therapy and that real reflective practitioner part of you. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, on, on the Thursdays after skill practice in, in stage one, you know, the whole class would find themselves just absolutely exhausted. Um, and everybody was was going to bed, and that was it. And we'll see you on Friday. Um, and it takes a while, you know, to get used to that. Um, it's challenging in lots of ways. It's challenging in, in in that that the amount of reflection that you do on yourself. You've got your teaching. You've got your um, personal therapy. Um, you've got your supervision and your placement. Um, so it's challenging emotionally and, and and sort of physically, but it's also challenging financially because it's not funded. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was, you know, as you can imagine, that was like I got about ten questions about that. <laughs> like, yeah. how is that possible to fund it? Like, obviously, you don't have to speak about your own finances, but yeah. like, for people on the on the course, how did most people fund it, and did they work? Um, it's all it's self funded, so you um, sort of do like. For me, I the other thing with the course was that you can exit after the first year with a master's in counseling psychology. Um, and actually, to be honest, whenever I um, went to do the course, that was what I had intended to do because financially I couldn't see how I would be able to afford it. Um, you know, you have just, you've got the cost of your tuition fees, that, you know, with the personal therapy, you have to do 45 hours of personal therapy. You have to pay for that. Um, your supervision, unless it's internal supervision that you're offered, um, which often isn't enough to meet the requirement for the course. So for example, in stage one, you have to have one hour of supervision for every six hours of therapy. In stage two and three, that changes to um, a ratio of one to eight. And often that um, wouldn't be met through the supervision that you might get internally. So you were paying for your own supervision as well as that, as well as getting to and from your placement. Um, your place placements weren't paid, um, things like that. So in, in terms of how, I went about funding it. As I said, my intention originally was just to do 
the, the first year. And um, what happened after that was I was I, I got myself and everybody around me could see how much I was enjoying what I was doing and had that real like you're gonna you're gonna finish it kind of thing. Um, so there was a range of ways that people funded it. Some people took out loans um, through like career development loans through the bank. Um, some people um, were from uh, some colleagues were from somewhere in Europe. They might have been sponsored. Um, to be there, so they were they were in, in one, one of the luckier positions. I get that. <laughs> I know. Um, myself, I also worked part time while I was doing the course right up until just before I sat my Viva. Um, I was working in retail, um, and and that meant that you know my week for the first two years looks like three days on placement, two days teaching, two days in work, and you just didn't have a break, you know. Um, but I was, it was difficult, but I did it because I knew the, the end result and I knew that it was only going to last for a certain length of time. Um, but it was, it was difficult. Um, otherwise, in terms of funding, um, some people took out private loans as well as not just like, through the bank and things like that. Um, in my third year, I was lucky enough that the placement that I had in the Children's Contact Centre, um, they then um, paid me um, for the role. So some people are lucky enough to secure placements or in some cases, you might get a, a placement that you, the placement doesn't pay you, but they might pay the cost of your supervision or your transport and things like that. Um, so, and otherwise, um, certainly it wasn't possible without the help of, um, you know, family as well in terms of being able to support you. But it is financially, it, it is a huge cost. Now, there's signs of that beginning to change, and, and there's some talk about potentially there being some funding in place for counseling psychology courses. Um, I, I'm very much of the opinion that at the very least, the, pla the placement should be paid. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when it's such it. it's such taxing work, like you said, you know, it's Absolutely. you give a lot of yourself, and to be doing yeah. that for free, it just seems unethical. Yeah. and I suppose I would I would say to anybody who's thinking about it that the financial uh, implication is something to be mindful of in terms of how that impacts on you. Then you know, um, I certainly was in a bubble in that I couldn't visit anybody. I didn't have the finances to go visit, and you know, other than visiting my own immediate family. Um, I wasn't in a position to be taking trips anywhere and seeing anybody else or, you know, even a night out, you know, you were always conscious of actually, you know, this meal could be one of my supervision sessions, yeah. <laughs> you know, you start to look at the world in that way, but it's, it's a very real... That's 10 supervisions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, um, you've, got to, you've got to weigh all that up um, and it was difficult, I'm, I, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not going to lie about it and I'm my, you know, my colleagues would all say the same, but it's a difficult thing to do, but what I would also say, and I think that's also, this is also important, I say it a lot to people who are currently in the midst of their training, um, is that where I'm at now is a very different place. So I have been fortunate enough, and all of my colleagues have been fortunate enough, everybody that graduated got it as in a job. Um, so you know that if you take out a loan or something that you are going to be able to be in a position to pay it back. Um, and the job prospects are good. Would you say they're good in Ireland as much in the UK. <laughs> yeah that one is to be uh it come back to me in six months time i think yeah. uh, <laughs> but in um, the uk you would say like in the uk they certainly are, are you um, you know the the council on psychology from my experience and i have to say it is just my experience and i haven't been in ireland um for the past few years so um it's sort of an outside looking in perspective it's not as well known. Um, jobs aren't as, as available. Um, I've been to, because actually I'm, I'm I'm in the process of moving back to Ireland. But I'm again because I live along the border. I'm in a good position that I have been able to secure work in Northern Ireland. Um, so it's a similar system. Um, you know, uh, certainly in Northern Ireland, the job prospects are much better. Um, the jobs that I've seen available are all advertised as you know counselling slash clinical or clinical slash counselling psychology posts. Um, in terms of um, the Republic of Ireland, it's much harder to get work. Um, I've spoken to a number of people who have, uh, for example, in, in the course in Glasgow, um, there would be a few people who would be living in Ireland but would travel over to Glasgow for teaching and just for teaching and then go back um, and they did their placement and everything in Ireland. So I think if you're in Ireland and thinking about doing a course in the UK, then that might be something to consider in terms of, it might sound like a lot in terms of travel and, and things, but Actually, if you have your placements in Ireland, then you're in a much better position. If you know that's where you're going to be in the long term, um, you've kind of got your foot in a wee bit if you're doing placements and things like that here. Um, 
from my own personal perspective, I don't see myself as ever working for the HSC. So therefore, it's not been something that I've been too concerned about or pursued too much. Um, but I know, again, from talking to colleagues that they've kind of sat on the kind of the panel and trying to be um, recognised and, and, and things like that. And they've had some difficulties um, with that. But again, what they would say is, um, in hindsight, if they knew that that's where they were going to be and if, if that's where they were planning on working, um, then they maybe would have done things differently when they were training. So I don't think it's impossible. Yeah. Um, it's just something to be mindful of in terms of, you know, for example, um, I don't have a placement or I, I never did a placement in learning disabilities. So um, in order to try and, and work in the HSE, that's something that would ha- I would have to try and, and get experience in now. Yeah, you know? actually, that's one of the one of the big questions that came up was like, as a counselling psychologist, are you limited, not limited, but like, is <laughs> your main area giving therapy or can you do additional say additional training and things to work with different populations like people with disabilities or like you mentioned yeah. in, in through the courts with families and things mm-hmm. like that. yeah so mm-hmm. those options are open yeah to those options are open to you again I think it's in your training it's what you make of it um so there was you know um a colleague of mine who um did his placement in Ireland um and did a learning disability placement and did so covered all the bases with regards to that um it's very much about, you know, I think that's, again, that's the good thing about it is it's where your interest lies. It's not somewhere that I, again, that I see myself working. So therefore it's not something that I pursued in terms of placements. Um, the, the, often the disadvantage or the, the limitations as a counselling psychologist come up when we talk about psychometrics and testing. Um, so there's no formal training while you're on the course in terms of using things like the WACE or anything like that. Um, but that's not to say that while you're on a placement, if you wanted it and you're, you had a supervisor who could do it, that you, you would get the training that way. Equally now in, um, in my post, if I wanted it, I could do it as an add-on. It's not a, um, but it's certainly not included in part of your formal training. And that's seen sometimes as a limitation. Um, and I would, I would argue that actually we've got other strengths. <laughs> <laughs> I actually you know, worked with, um, I worked with a psychologist, a clinical psychologist before, and he was saying all the doctorates, you know, you make your career after doctorate, really, like. Absolutely, I think so, yeah. You make it part of it while you're training, um, but I think on the whole, you make it what you want it to be, you know. Um, if you were speaking with a counselling psychologist, you know, who was very much um, knew that their long-term plan was going to be to work in either the NHS or the HSC, for example, um, you would probably be having a very different conversation with them because they know that's where their career path is going. Although I'm in that post at the minute, that's not where I see myself long term. Um, so that's why I, you know, I could do, uh, you know, the, the British Psychological Society, for example, um, offer training in psychometrics that you can do as kind of add-ons, you know, so, so those are always options. So I don't see it entirely as a limitation. And I think certainly where we might lack in that skill we make up for in other ones and that's the beauty about everybody doing different training and things like that exactly um this is the the age-old question now <laughs> what is the difference between clinical counseling psychotherapy and, counsel- and a counselor <laughs> oh. it's so simple but like it, from my perspective all four pe- of those people could have very similar jobs wouldn't they yeah they could all be doing the same job really but is it the training or the history or obviously the qualifications but yeah I think this is, this is a really interesting question and we get asked it so much and I suppose when I was thinking about this earlier you know when you'd sent me over some of the questions that people have put in I thought isn't it interesting that even you know myself with you know I've studied psychology for seven years and that question comes up and I still go oh how do I answer that so if, if after all that training I'm ask, asking that then what must most people you know, um, the general population who maybe are are thinking about therapy, uh, how do they make sense of it? Um, It's a big question. Um, I suppose I can only give what I, how I make sense of it, um, in that I think in the room with a client, they could all look like they're doing very similar things. Um, But perhaps the theory that is going on or or what's going on behind the scenes is slightly different. I think um, training is, is the big thing that makes a difference between for example a clinical psychologist or a counseling psychologist from a counselor or a psychotherapist in that they have a psychology degree so therefore they that's where the psychologist bit comes in but that doesn't equate to experience 
you know. Yeah. So a, a counsellor who's worked for 20 years can be just as experienced as a, a newly qualified clinical or counselling psychologist. Um, so it's difficult, to, but I think in terms of things like affordability as a client, you know, that's where the, you'll see the difference. So it's usually more for a clinical or counselling psychologist than it would be for a counsellor. And sometimes a psychotherapist is usually in the middle of that. The other difference can be that perhaps a counsellor might be trained in only one modality. So only person-centred or only CBT, but it's not always the case. Um, whereas a counsellor and psychologist, for example, it has to be trained in at least two. So the course that I did was person-centred in CBT. Other courses are psychodynamic. Um, as well, but there's always that person-centred, um, that humanistic element for counselling psychology. Um, so, but I think very much in terms of in the room, the differences aren't as obvious. Um, I, I often think it would be a good um, sort of experiment to set up if you put the same client in with the different professions, how would it be worked with? And would you really see a difference? Um, and actually, I'm not sure that the difference would even come down to training. I think it comes down to from my experience, it's not necessarily something that I agree with, but from services that I've worked in and from talking to colleagues, they'll off, often the conversation comes up of what's the difference in counselling and what's the, what's the difference between counselling and psychology. Often what I've heard people say or how it's described, and, and I agree somewhat, but I don't entirely agree, is that um, counselling is often saw more as like a listening type of service. I think it's much more than that, but um, for example, if somebody came to you and you were trying to decide whether they need counselling or whether they need psychology, um, often it would be thinking about is there a sort of a goal in mind or is it in their presentation? And if there's a goal or something to work towards, then perhaps that's psychology. Whereas if it's somebody they need a space to talk and share how they're feeling, then that's more counselling. It's never as black and white as that, um, but that tends to be how people sometimes kind of differentiate between. Um, yeah, or maybe if, like, between. if there's a trauma in the past in someone's past or something versus someone's yeah. just going through kind of a rough patch yeah that's the other thing the other thing that often determines um for example an assessment whether or not somebody goes to counseling or goes to psychology is do they meet the criteria you know for um in the dsm or the icd for you know um ptsd or depression or something so w when they meet the criteria for that then perhaps they'd be more suited to psychology again it's very much dependent on who the person the presentation it's never as black and white as that because people just aren't you know as, as it don't fit into boxes um but that's often the difference um within services that's where you would see the difference in between terms of who goes to a counselor who goes to a, um, a counseling psychologist um and in scotland here they have um, a post called uh, a clinical associate in applied psychology or a cap which is a, um, a training that's kind of a lot of people will do before they do their clinical psychology or counseling psychology and doctorate um, and again, um, it's a CBT training. Um, so, for example, in the service that I work in, um, if somebody was attending and they had an assessment with one of the CAPS and they felt that it wasn't CBT that that person needed, then they would be referred to a, a psychologist instead. Um, like in, in your experience in, say, the NHS, when where people like do have access to mental health services and things, do this does a psychologist get like quote unquote the worst clients or the most long term mental illness kind of rather than yeah. they would where other you know maybe an assistant psychologist could speak could provide cbt for someone with mild depression yeah that i think sense? that's you know that, that, that's that's how it's supposed to work in that um the more severe cases are supposed to be seen by the psychologist um within services um, those more mild to moderate presentations perhaps seen um, by a counsellor um, you know we don't have a, we have a, we're all psychologists in the service that I work in um, and I think it's diff it can be difficult to tell you know what somebody's presenting with um, even at an assessment stage until you get to get to know them but um, often it is the case that the psychologists work with more severe presentations and I don't necessarily always think that that's the right thing i actually think in terms of your caseload and things you should it should be quite varied in yeah i imagine of, that's difficult like when you're yeah. yeah um i work at the moment with um a lot of trauma which you know has it's difficult to work with it and i think that's a really important thing to be mindful of and in, in, in counseling psychology or any you know in clinical psychology as well that um it it's a very different it is a very difficult job that we do you know yeah. 
Um, and I think that's important when people are looking for placements. And I think that's why it's good to get that experience is you learn the types of, you know, presentations and populations that you can work with, that you can't work with. Um, you learn to manage your caseload. You learn to talk about it in supervision and, and really say like, actually, do you know what? I don't know if I can take on another case like that because this is what my caseload looks like at the minute. And that's important for loads of reasons, not just for your own well-being, but also we need to see that, as you know, we all need to see that we're making progress. Um, and if you've all got only severe cases on, on your caseload, then sometimes you can get disheartened because you can think, you know, well, I'm not, nothing's shifting here. Um, so having a range of presentations is important um, as well. But those are all things that I think you learn through your placements. Yeah. And are there guidelines to protect your mental health as in like a limit to how many clients you see a week or how many you see a day? There is no set guidance. Um, um there's no as i said there's no there's no set guidance so i would see a maximum of six um in a day uh the bps uh i think they have a recommendation of or i'm going to say around 20 something a week um but it's like that it's like it's like use your own judgment and the service uses its own judgment and things like that um again i think that's important in terms of both placement and um you know the jobs that you take afterwards trying to weigh that up and think about um, you know, is the service able to give you time for your own mental health and, and well-being and what's, what's the caseload like? Um, those are all questions to ask at interviews and things like that. You know, what's the caseload like? How much supervision do I get? Um, and, and over the training, you know, you would never, you wouldn't start your placement and on the first day have, be given six people. You know, that's the good thing you build up um, to that um, with time. But it's, yeah, it's, it's certainly, it can be difficult at times. And what do you think may, would make a good counselling psychologist? You know, <laughs> from people you met on the course, is there a common trait or, because one of the questions that came up was, someone was interested in counselling psychologists, but they wouldn't be the stereotypical person that you might go to, their friends don't all come to them with their, with their problems. Mm. So mm -hmm. they were asking, is yeah. that stereotype true that you should be the one that... I think, uh, I think it's, not it's not necessary, mm -hmm. you know, but I think it is a trait that you see, you know, that um, there's a, a, a paper, I think it's called the wounded, the wounded healer, um, that idea that we've all kind of, you know, most of the people on the course have had some experiences that have led them to then want to help other people. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's necessary. And one of the things that I would say, if we go back to that idea of, you know, what's the difference in clinical and counseling and things like that, um, when, for example, when, when you do the, the training, either, I'm not sure, I can't speak for what it's like when you're doing a clinical psychology um, doctorate, but there's often that like, you know, oh, the other side, you know, clinical psychologists are over there, we're over here. And from, from my experience um, working, it's been very much that actually, I don't think clinical psychologists and counseling psychologists are that different. And certainly we're seeing that it's becoming, you know, quite similar in terms of the jobs that we apply for and everything. They say clinical slash counseling psychologist. Um, I think w rather than being broken into clinical or counselling psychologists, I think there's actually two different types of clinical and counselling psychologists. There are those who are um, perhaps more in that kind of what I would see traditionally clinical psychology, where they um, are much more in line with like the medical model in assessment, diagnosis and language like that. Um, and then there are the counselling and clinical psychologists who are more on the kind of person-centred, reflective um, less, you know, using medical language. Um, I still have, you know, for example, I see a place for diagnosis and, and, and things like that, but it's, uh, it's not something that I get too fixated on when it comes to working with people. So I think what I've seen from working is that the split is much more across clinical and counseling psychologists rather than clinical versus counseling psychologists. Um, and I think that's a lot to do with how, the, how you are as a person. Um, so in terms of coming back to that idea of, you know, do you need to be somebody who is always the one who helps people? I don't think so. Um, because when I that question, I was like, that's actually the an advantage. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. you might not burn out if everyone in their personal life isn't coming to yeah. you. And, and, and part of the reason that the, the course, you know, is so geared towards thinking about you is because you have to keep in mind the impact that you have on um, on clients when you're, when you're working with them. And sometimes it could be an advantage to not always be that person, um, you know, because you can't do this job if you just want to, if it's for you, if it's to make you feel better about helping people. Um, and you learn that very early on. Although we've all had experiences of that and, you know, you know, yeah, we're, you know, 
we might be in our personal lives that might be what we do um, but you learn very early on that the purpose of it can't be to make you feel better um, that's not what it's about um, so perhaps not having that trait in you in your in your kind of personal um, life it's not a disadvantage I don't think um, and certainly it's I think you know in situations like that it might be helpful to think about what type of modalities do I want to um, yeah, study and so perhaps maybe more like CBT and psychodynamic rather than the person-centered what well, you've got always been element of person-centered um, in it but um, again you know of all the people that I graduated with we're all very different counseling psychologists and um, so one of the big differences in terms of training uh, um, is the viva that you do as a counseling psychologist um, compared to clinical psychology so clinical psychology is very much based on your research um, counseling psychologist the viva is based on um, a lot about you and your development um, so there's there's questions you know such as um, the criteria or things like can you tell us a bit about how you understand how your personal life can impact your professional life? Wow. Um, how have you engaged with personal therapy and supervision? Um, how do you handle feedback from your peers, from supervisors um, and from your clients? Um, so it's a conversation much more about you. And do um, you do research as part of the doctors as well? You do, you do your research as well. So there's a research question in, in your Viva. Um, it might be a, the panel might ask you a question about your research. I didn't, I think, um, get asked in mine. You do, you do research. So I did my research on um, emotional burden in dementia carers. Um, so trying to see kind of what support people um, who were caring for somebody with dementia were getting. Um, it's not a huge part of, uh, of the course, but it is, there is a research element there. And again, that's about making what you want of it. So for some people who know that they want to do some research kind of post qualification um, they engage more with that element of the course um, so they, they'll be then you know going to get their research published and things like that um, so again that's that, that lovely thing where you can make of it what you want and just I'm just interested in that did you interview carers or did you do a survey or I interviewed I did um, IPA research I interviewed six carers um, both in the UK and in Ireland um, to see um, what came out of that uh, really interesting research and actually the reason that I did it again this is where that personal and professional kind of can come in is um, in those two years between my psychology degree and my um, the doctorate uh, my grandmother had dementia and I was part of the family who were caring for her and one of the things that I noticed was that there was a real lack of emotional support um, for what was happening and then after um, I think just before I had perhaps gone to do the doctorate, I'd been involved in uh, a project where we brought together um, carers to see what support they would like. And that was one of the things that was mentioned was actually um, people didn't know who to talk to about what they were experiencing. Um, so that was a research interest of mine from, from the start. So that's, that's, that's where I went with it. And they were, were they family carers or were they like working? They were family carers. Family carers, family yeah. Family carers. So I suppose, yeah. is it kind of like, like grief? Is it like you're losing the person and yeah there was a number of things came up from from the research one of those was that um people felt that they weren't it was difficult to be providing care for somebody while at the same time grieving for them yeah so, um there was also things around kind of you know because they were family carers um they the impact of that on their own family life for example if somebody had this you know somebody had a young family um, how, you know the, the whole family's life was interrupted because the care was very much 24 7 they never switched off um, and although for example one of the things that came out of my research was that often the support that's provided isn't always matched to the care so people are often encouraged you know um, there's respite services available why don't you um, you know put the person into respite for two weeks for example um, but the carers didn't always find that helpful because although the person was physically safe they were continuing to phone, for example, for them, or they were distressed, uh, or they were very distressed when they came out of the respite, so it wasn't really doing what it was supposed to do. Yeah. Um, you know, Whereas, like, maybe someone coming into the house and helping would have made more sense. Yeah. 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 And one of the, the other things that came up was that often it's too late before support is brought in, um, so people feel like they really have to be absolutely desperate um, before support is provided, uh, and and that's a real difficulty because. It's, it's a stressful enough thing to be doing to be providing care for somebody with dementia to then have to fight for support. Yeah. Um, you know, 
uh, and often sometimes it seemed to be perceived as though they weren't coping or that it was a real negative thing. And actually what they were saying is, you know, if I got support six months ago, then I wouldn't be as burnt out as I am now. Yeah, I think there's a misconception that like, these people, they want to care for them. They just need extra support, you know, yeah. That's it. Yeah. There's a misconception yeah. that they don't want to do it. They do want to, but they just need help, kind of. Yeah, yeah. and I think that idea of, you know, that um, what part of my research looked at, you know, the financial implications of having people um, in hospitals or care homes. And actually, if they're being provided, if they're being cared for in their own homes, um, it saves, you know, it saves money, it saves resources and things like that. Um, but we can't overlook the impact that has on the person that's providing care. Um, so, so yeah, that's what my, my research was on. But again, um, research in terms of the course, it very much depended on what people were interested in. Um, so, you know, it might have been um, looking at uh, trauma, eating disorders. Um, there's a whole range of topics, you know, um, and very much just where people's interests were. And you mentioned like DBT and schema therapy in your final. Mm -hmm. You were like really passionate about schema therapy or DBT. I actually love those two and I did them in college. Mm -hmm. um, could you go on and do like extra training in that and specialise in that as a consultant psychologist? Yeah, again, um, the BPS um, in the UK, I'm not 100% sure um, in terms of the, the status in Ireland with these things, but um, the BPS offer training workshops that you can attend. Um, if you attend them while you're a student, again, it's difficult because they cost money, so you don't always have that to do that. Um, in terms of my work, for example, if it was something that I felt strongly that I wanted to pursue, then there's an opportunity that I would do it through my, through my work. Um, but... Yeah, certainly they're all there. It, it, to me, it's quite a good way of, it's almost like taster sessions and all the different types of, yeah. so there was ACT, there was DBT, there was compassion focused therapy, emotion focused therapy, um, systemic therapy, which obviously was interested to me for interest, like of interest to me because of what I was doing. Um, so it's a good chance to, to get a bit of insight into those. Um, mm -hmm. And then just, you know, so you, that if in the future you want to pursue them any further, at least you have some idea. Yeah. Of, what's what's going on you know i just wanted to ask about on personal therapy during the course mm -hmm. so i had a discussion with a lecturer when i was in final year we were talking about like the ethical considerations with that like do you think it's ethical to force someone to go to therapy <laughs> do i think it's ethical like, to do was, that i don't was it helpful yeah. to you during the course to be in therapy yeah. but i think for me i actually think that in general, we would all benefit from every so often having six sessions of therapy yeah. where we can go and talk to somebody. So I, I, that's something, you know, I'm mindful that that's my, my thoughts on it. Um, there certainly was conversations about like, is it, you know, is it ethical to make us do that? Um, I think it's really an important part of the therapy. And the reason being that I don't think until you put yourself in that situation that you understand how anxiety provoking it is for somebody for the first appointment um, with yourself. So it's it's helpful on a personal level in terms of you know having an opportunity to talk through some of your own things, but actually in terms of the process of it and what that's like um, for you know simple simple things, but actually really important things like what's it like to contact you know four different people to reach out to them for therapy and, and only two of them get back to you. And then two of them to get back to you and say, actually, I don't have any availability at the minute. Um, so how many times do you have to do that before you can get access to therapy? Then when you do, um, how much information are you provided about where to go? Um, when do you have the conversation about how much it's gonna cost? Mm -hmm. All of those things, if it's private, for example, or if it's in a service, um, again, you know, how much information do you get about the person that you're going to go speak to? How much of an understanding do you even have about what you're going to go and do? Sometimes we see people who are referred by their GP and they come and they say, I really didn't know what to expect. Or they say, um, well, you're going to fix me. And, and, and so, so the expectations around that, but also about thinking, yeah, those first sessions are really difficult um, for people to engage in. And it takes a lot for people to come you know, for therapy. So experiencing that for yourself, having that anxiety of going in and knowing that you have to talk to somebody and what's this going to be like? What, how am I going to get along with this person? That, to me, that's really a really important part um, of our training. And also in terms of, you know, one of the things that I often say to people in therapy is that, it, and that comes back to what we were talking about earlier, but it actually doesn't really matter the experience that the therapist has or the 
uh, qualifications that they have, the most important thing the research shows us is a therapeutic relationship. So you have to be able to have a good relationship with that person. Um, and you have to be able to know what it's like to go and speak to somebody that you've never met before and then potentially have that conversation where you say, like, actually, I don't think we're going to get along. And it's nothing personal between us. It's just that as we relate to different people in our everyday lives, we'll also relate differently to different therapists. But from a personal perspective, going and, and engaging in that process, I took a lot from that. Um, so, and also on a personal level, I do think it's important. Um, I think, as I said, we could all benefit from having sort of, you know, six sessions every so often um, with somebody in the same way as maybe so, every so often you check in with your GP and get your bloods done and make sure you're all okay kind of thing. Um, I, th I think it's an important um, thing. I think it's, I, I do agree that, you know, is it, is it fair to force that on somebody, you know, um, and there is a debate around that. But I also think that perhaps when you're in training, that's probably the time for it to be kind of enforced upon you in some way. Um, I, certainly, I don't think I would have managed um, without it. You never know what's going to come up um, for you as you go into these kind of, you know, trainings and professions and stuff. You never know what's going to come up or when, when you're on placement with clients. And you have to make use of supervision and therapy, you know, um, to get the most out of it, I think. I think that's often people say like, oh, I have supervision, so it's fine. But supervision is really for what you're doing with the client and the personal therapy is really about how is it, how is it impacting on you. Yeah, yeah that um, makes sense. I've never, I've never heard it like broken down like that, that. The actual experience of like going, sitting in the waiting room, having to ring them, all that, like the energy that takes if you're not feeling well, yeah. a lot more yeah. of that. And, and actually it's something that I... Um, so I continue to have personal therapy. It's my own choice um, post-qualification because I, I do believe that, that it's helpful. It's not something I have regularly. I, I'll go for a while and then I might go uh, and then something might come up and I think, okay, it's helpful to go. Um, but for example, with what's happening now in terms of um, everybody, you know, all of my appointments at the moment are on the telephone um, in my own work. And then I had been having therapy and, and again, my therapist phoned and said, you know, I'm, obviously I have to have telephone appointments. Um, and initially I said, well, do you know what, I'd rather just wait until face-to-face, -face. there's nothing really urgent going on. And then I thought, actually, it would be helpful, if not for nothing else, for my own process to see what it's like to do this over the phone. Um, yeah, so true. I have a few appointments to say, like, actually, do you know what, and, and that was really important because it then made me think about, um, for my own work with clients, for example, um, I started to think about, I wonder where this person is when they're having this conversation. So a lot of my clients would be, for example, in their bedroom when they're having a conversation. Um, and then we talked about like, is that really the best place to have it? Because I wonder what that impact on your sleep. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, or um, if you can't go to a different room in the house, how do we create a space in your own home that's very different to how your house normally looks? So for some people, I'll say like, if you have a kitchen chair, could you just take it to a window and just sit and look out the window and then put the chair back? And then that's that space gone um, because we're potentially contaminating that. You know, yeah. and even or even as a counselor, if you're talking about trauma all day, should you be doing that in your kitchen? You know, or, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and I at the minute I'm working from home, um, which is a very interesting. It's not something I I, I really thought I would do. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic so from my perspective. Again, um, I very much feel like my my work in my home space have become the one, and it would be different if I had an office, for example, in the home that I would use. But I don't. I have my kitchen. Um, so I have to manage the boundaries around that very clearly and I have my own ways of doing that in terms of at the end of the day everything gets packed away and suddenly it's, it's the kitchen again you know but during the day it's very much the office pizza time um, <laughs> yeah you know um but so the, the to me that's the benefit of, of the, the personal therapy and, and engaging with it it's for the process of it as well as the personal element of it yeah oh, that's really interesting so I looked at your website I really liked it I especially like the 10 year project that you're working on you yeah um, that's something that I, so as I mentioned, in my, my role at the minute, I work with adults, but I have uh, an interest in working with children and young people. Um, and so in my kind of private work, that's, that's where my attention is focused at the moment. And I had been doing some work with um, an organisation here in Scotland who had talked about how anxiety provoking it was for a lot of young people who were leaving school. And it wasn't happening the way that 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 they planned they weren't having their leavers party if they were in um you know uh, doing their leaving cert or their a-levels and a lot of anxiety around you know what's going to happen and, and going to university and things like that and i just thought it would be helpful um for 
and it's something that I've done in the past, have conversations and through workshops where we talk about, you know, it's difficult to tell a, you know, a, you know, a young person it'll, it'll work out. <laughs> No, yeah. we, you know, we might hear that when we're younger, but we don't, we don't believe it. So I tried to think about what would be a good way of offering that reassurance that they don't just hear it from me. Um, because if I'm there to offer a workshop, then of course I'm going to say, you know, it will work out. So I approached some of my classmates um, and explained that this is an idea that I had um, thinking about, you know, if you were to think 10 years ago, what, what, what were we thinking about? What were the anxieties that we had? What were the worries that we had? And what would we tell ourselves? Um, now looking back. Uh, and so I'm really grateful that a lot of people engaged um, with it and provided some insights. And it was really interesting. And I've had people even who are, you know, for example, have left school and have gone to uni and, you know, in their early 20s say that actually it was helpful to look at just as, just as that reassurance that actually, you know, things will be okay. Um, yeah. you know, I thought it was actually but, really applicable to this podcast as well. Like that part in between your degree and your master's or your master's yeah. or whatever it can feel like what if I never get on Absolutely. I never get a job <laughs> like yeah. you're kind of qualified to do nothing and you're like yeah what if but in 10 years time hopefully even if we're not psychologists well you know we'll have some, something will have worked out and you know absolutely yeah it just it's it, the 10 years from now felt felt relevant because it's 2010 whenever I left school it's 2020 yeah. now and that that real 10 year milestone is there um, but you're right, absolutely. You know, if I think back to when I left my psychology degree, I really did not know where I was going to go with that. Um, and I remember making that choice to take some time out and some family being very strong on like, don't don't take a gap here, like go and do something because you'll never go back kind of thing. And a part of me was always confident that I would go back, but I wanted it to be going back to do something that I knew I wanted to do. And um, it can be disheartening sometimes after, you know, you've completed the psychology degree to know where to go next. And I, I think particularly if you're if you feel like you want to be a clinical psychologist and get on the clinical psychology programs um, it's very competitive it's very difficult um, so you can be very easily disheartened um, it's I have to say I personally never had for whatever reason never had a real interest in being a clinical psychologist um, and I don't mean that in a bad way it just it, it, when I was doing my psychology degree it was often talked about how Clinical psychology was all about assessing people and diagnosing them. And I just thought, I don't want to do that. Um, so it never even, it was never something I was going to go do. Mm. Um, whereas a lot of the people perhaps who did the counselling psychology doctorate will, will, will say very clearly, actually, it's because I couldn't get accepted onto the, the clinical one. I've been rejected so many times. Um, but you have to be in a position to be able to then pay for the counselling psychology one and stuff like that. You know, but, yeah. um, Sorry, I've gone off a bit of a tangent there. But. No, no, that's really relevant. Like, I think maybe yeah. some, maybe some people as well want to be clinical psychologists because it's so sought after. Yeah, and the, what I think they're so. really picturing is maybe counselling psychology, or also because it's funded in Ireland, it makes sense to go for that because you're getting yeah. paid. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's it. I think, uh, you know, for a long time, and I still think to some degree, it's sort of you know, if you do psychology, then you you should be a clinical psychologist. That's what you should aim for. Um, and anything less than that is less than mm -hmm. something. Um, and, and, that, and I don't think that is the case. I think, you know, you know, the, those, the profession is starting to kind of merge into lots of, you know, we're seeing that with the jobs all being advertised. You'll start to see now, also I've noticed in the UK, it might say clinical slash counselling slash health slash forensic psychologist, you know. So there's a real overlap in the skills um, there. And for me it'd be interesting you know for perhaps if we were to have this conversation in a year's time with me having been in ireland for a while you we can know, I'll what, you in. yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know but it, it would be interesting to see yeah. okay you know now that i've been in ireland for a while here's the differences th yeah. that i know that you know um and i think having made the decision to go back to ireland that's something that i had to consider is my experience as a counseling psychology isn't as well known yeah. um it certainly, as I said, it wasn't mentioned at all whenever I did my um, degree in Galway. It wasn't wasn't mentioned. Uh, when you know, you notice it when you talk to friends and family, and you say I'm a counselling psychologist, and it just they, they don't quite grasp it. You know, you're a counsellor or you're a psychologist, but you're not a counselling psychologist because they don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, um, so that's something that I've been mindful of as I as I make this plan to move back to Ireland. But I also think. Um, that perhaps there's the potential there to make it a bit more well known, um, you know, um, and to really be part of that kind of first wave of establishing it. Mm -hmm. 
in Ireland. So uh, it's not something that I'm, I've shied away from. And it's something that I hope and I think, I think counseling psychology fits very well with um, the sort of attitudes um, in Ireland in terms of the community and, and support and things like that. So um, I, I'm interested to see yeah. what it's going to be like. Amazing. Yeah. Can I ask, because we're in, we're coming out of lockdown now and mm-hmm. I see a lot of headlines like tsunami of mental health issues to come and all this stuff. Yeah. Do you think there's some delayed reaction of mental health issues that are coming down the line? I think that, um, I think there will be some implications of it, but I think that, don't get me wrong, I think it's great that we talk so much about our mental health. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is being able to talk about mental health and knowing about what services you're accessing and being kind of educated and informed about decisions that you make about your mental health. Um, But sometimes I think we tip too far the other way, um, where we create a mental health, I'm not saying we're creating a mental health crisis, that's not what I mean, but um, we sort of set the expectation of like, oh, we've been through a pandemic, we're in a crisis, you have to have um, sure, a mental health response. Depression. Yeah, are you, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting, I had a conversation with one of my colleagues recently about, um, certainly over here what we're seeing is um, a lot of support being offered to uh, nurses and doctors. Um, and the conversation we were having was about, actually, do we need to do that right now? Or do we let people's natural responses um, you know, come into force here where, you know, for example, in trauma and things like that, we have that period of time often referred to as kind of watchful waiting, where we wait and see, you know, do they naturally recover from that or do they need more input? Um, and I think we could very quickly rush in and say, like, all the doctors and nurses, for example, need mental health support. Um, but actually, do they need mental health support or do they just need time to recover from the fact that they have just had a very difficult experience? And perhaps people will naturally recover from that. Um, but then we certainly should be there to support the people who don't recover naturally from that. Absolutely. Um, and that's the same. Like it's normal to be stressed and it's normal. Absolutely. To- yeah. You know, I talk to people on a, on, a, on a daily basis now who are saying, you know, I'm suddenly very anxious because I'm, I'm going out about a lot more. Um, and it is about normalizing that and saying, well, I think, you know, we're all a bit anxious because we see words, you know, in the news. It's a pandemic. It's a crisis. Um, and it is those things. So it's natural for us to have anxiety in response to that. Um, it's about how we manage that then. And I do think we will see some waves in terms of um, the demand on mental health services. I think some, but I think it's a, it's a different, it'll be different types of issues, for example. Like um, one thing that I think we're not very good at these days is spending time by ourselves with ourselves and lockdown has forced us to do that um and it's forced us and and that's been good for some people because what we see for some people is it allows them to press pause and kind of you know figure out okay you know i've got an opportunity to think now and i don't have any pressure to go outside and what do i want to do for other people that's very scary um and that and those people who usually are quite busy, keep themselves very busy, out and about all the time, so, you know, work all the time, those kind of things, have suddenly been forced to sort of sit with whatever it is that's going on for them. Um, and it, again, it might be that once these restrictions ease, they get back into that pattern of actually, I'm okay now, I'm getting a bit busier, um, but they also might need support. Um, so yeah, I, I'm interested to see what way this goes. I think like from a family perspective as well, it's interesting, like say you're a working family and in normal times you'd be at home with the baby for maybe parental leave or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you're back at work and you see the baby in the evening and maybe bath time and, and pe- people had time to just have like every day in this at home together. So I think that's maybe there's some good there in it as well from a family perspective. Yeah, you know, I also think that we might see, um, you know, a lot of people with social anxiety and things like that have said actually it's been giving me such a break I don't have to go outside nobody's telling me nobody's making me feel bad about it and things like that um you're like you, you know, will have to go outside again <laughs> yeah I know I know but there's a there's an element of they've sort of given been given a chance to like rest and recuperate yeah. and perhaps have a bit more energy to go back outside um and sometimes you know it's like that you know almost like you know when you're not forced to do something then you want to start to want to do it you know, so people are starting to say, like, actually, I'm, I'm sick of being inside now. I want to go outside and, 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 and do that. But um, it, it'll certainly be very interesting to see what happens going forward um, in terms of mental health. I do think where we're going to see a, a bit of a wave, um, perhaps not in the near future, is with um, a lot of young people, children and young people who 
um, are, are are missing out on that kind of socialization. Um, the kind of rite of passage kind of thing. Yeah, I think you know I do think there'll be some long lasting impacts um, there. Yeah, maybe like even things like the leaving certain Ireland or the A levels, and mm -hmm. they, if you're given, even if you're given six hundred points or something, but you didn't do sit leaving certain points, you know, is there going to yeah. be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you know, what we think about young kids who maybe are meant to be in their first year of school um, and, you know, all the things that you learn in terms of making friends and things like that. And all of a sudden that's all being taken away. And how will they then react whenever they go back to school and, um, you know, things like that. Uh, or, you know, young people who are in an unfortunate situation where there's, you know, a lot of abuse and things at home yeah. who have been in that situation now for weeks. Um, so there, there will be... I think there will be peaks in, in different populations' mental health needs, um, both in the immediate future and in the long term. Um, but I do think, yeah, there's a danger of us all going, we all need, we're all going to, you know, really, really need mental health support here. Um, um, yeah, so we're on to our last question. Um, what would be, what are three things in your mental health toolbox? So, um, I did actually make a note because I thought I could waffle here, so let me double check what I said. Oh yeah. So the big one for me, and this is something that I learned uh, the hard way, I would say, um, and is scheduling breaks, knowing that you're going to have some time off. Um, so, for example, I mentioned that I was very much in a bubble while I was doing my training, and one of the things that I did was um, I can't remember exactly the length of time, but I went at quite a significant length of time without having any time off. Um, and then what I did went home for Christmas, but I'd made the decision that when I went home for Christmas, I wasn't going to do any work, um, which is totally unheard of whenever you're, <laughs> you're doing a doctorate. Um, I wasn't going to do any work for the week. I wasn't going to check my emails. I wasn't going to read any psychology books. I wasn't going to read any papers. I was just going to take some time off. And when I came back, I felt so, I felt like a new person. And I had a conversation with my supervisor about it. And he had shared with me that actually what he does is, is uh, schedule regular breaks for himself in advance. And that's something that I've really taken on board. So typically in my diary, every six weeks, I'll have a long weekend um, or, or, or a week break or whatever. Um, and it's, it's all well and good saying like, oh, I'm going to do that every six weeks. But if I don't put it in the diary in advance, then it's not going to happen. Um, so when I look at my diary for the next 12 months, it's about saying like, I'm going to I'm going to put that in in advance um, and that's so important so that you don't reach that phase of being burnt out and fatigued and everything and and I know whenever I'm at that point um, because I love my job I love getting up I don't I don't it is work but uh, I don't hate going to my work by any means I love it but if I don't have those breaks then I start to feel very tired and I start to and I, I notice those things and then I, I have to say to myself like what am I doing here you know um, so to me, breaks is, is a huge thing. Um, Self-care is another one that we talk about a lot in terms of, um, we, we, it's talked about a lot whenever you're training and things like that. And I always think it's an interesting one because often when we think about self-care, we think, you know, booking a holiday, going somewhere. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I need to go to, you know, uh, a yoga class and a gym class three times a week. I need to do all these things. And actually, um, in training uh, we I remember having a really helpful conversation with one of my colleagues where we were talking about how there's just there's no time there was no time to do anything um and you were hearing you know other people talking about self-care and, and doing all these different things and we had a conversation where we said actually self-care in the, at that stage in our lives was for example making an appointment with the dentist because we hadn't done it it was um going to the doctor if there was something you know a pain that you had that you weren't seeing to um, it was self-care for me while I was training instead of being sore on myself that I wasn't making it to the gym and doing all these different things it was making sure that I was eating trying to eat good food um, getting a bit of air making sure that I had those breaks scheduled and um, and doing things like making a doctor's appointment you know um, that's really important when you're training especially um, you know so don't set yourself massive expectations in terms of self-care you have to you know that kind of maslow's hierarchy of needs you have to take care of the basics yeah. before you're able to take care of those other things so that was that's important and i think the other the other thing would be boundaries are, are important in terms of your um that, that's a difficult one i think to 
learn how to do. Um, particularly if you are the type of person who is naturally a helper, you know. And I think that's one of the things that, that I've learned to manage with my training and stuff. And that's part of your training is learning to manage that, that I'm not suddenly a free therapist for my family and friends. <laughs> You know, um, I'm I'm their friend and I'm the family member, but I'm not the therapist. Um, and and getting that boundary in place, getting it clear in your own mind, so that you can then convey it to other people. Boundaries in terms of, you know, uh, leaving work whenever you you finish work or leaving your placement whenever you finish placement. Um, having your weekend, your your day off or whatever. Um, so really clear boundaries, to me, is is, is essential. Um, not always easy to put into practice. Um, certainly. At different times uh, becomes more difficult but um trying to kind of keep that in your mind remind yourself you know what are my boundaries here what am i willing to do and not do and um i guess that coincides with that kind of having breaks and things you know so sort, sort of having your own mental health review every so often and saying like okay how have i been over the past few months do i want to keep working like that or what am i going to do differently yeah, yeah that would be great that actually makes sense it's like, i've always wondered like how how do you manage your own mental health when you're constantly yeah. or in like in crisis or you know yeah. yeah and i think it's you know i think that's something to be mindful of in this profession um in all the help and profession but i think as a psychologist particularly um there's two sides one is i think you know i say this a lot that i think that we're in a really privileged position um that people come to us with um very difficult problems share with us things that often they haven't shared with anybody else before um and that comes back to that idea of having been to a therapist i understand the process that that takes for that person to come and see me um but the flip side of that is it does have an impact on you as a person and that's why it's so important that you have good supervision um that you have peer supervision as well as you know your you know peer supervision has been essential for me throughout the, the training you know i've got a really good good peer group um, where we have that, you know, if we need to ring and speak about something, then, then, then we do it. That's really important. Um, but don't underestimate that it does have an impact on you. It can't not have an impact on you when you when you hear what you hear. Um, I I give something to clients um, whenever I finish working with them, and I think it's probably the best way I have of explaining. Um, so what I kind of say is that I like to think that when we meet people, we leave a mark. On each other that if you could see it it would kind of be like a colored imprint that you would leave on the other person um and that as a psychologist i would always hope that that's an, a, a positive mark that i would leave on somebody else but that's maybe not always i also acknowledge it's not always the case so i'll say you know there might be times that maybe we've talked about something um i've maybe not said the right thing or i didn't ask a question um whenever you wanted me to but my intention has always been that that mark that i leave in therapy is always a positive one um but equally that person leaves a mark on me yeah. um and and what i always say to clients is that actually you know it's really important that you know that you've left a mark on me and that in the future that the phrase i use is in the future you know a word somebody sa says um a feeling sometimes um or uh something that i see will draw my attention back to the mark that that person has left on me and I always say, you know, like in that moment, I'll always kind of wish you well. Um, and that's an important thing um, to, to acknowledge that just as we impact on the clients, they also impact on us. Um, and you have to take care of that. Yeah. You know, you have to, you know, so everybody finds their way of um, managing that. And I think that's, that's important. That's beautiful. That's really like humanistic and, you know, it's acknowledging that like you're a professional who's paid, but you're also a human being and. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. Um, and again, I think that I'm not saying I, I can't speak because I haven't been through the clinical psychology program, but I think that's maybe part of the counseling psychology, um, you know, where I say, you know, we have our skills are in other places is paying attention to things like that. Um, you know, the endings of therapy are really important, not just for the client, but also for us, mm -hmm. um, because we do build really deep, meaningful relationships with people. Or that's always what we're striving to do, um, because out of that good therapeutic relationship comes, in my opinion, an awful lot of change. Um, but we can't underestimate that, as I said, we leave a mark on, on the client, they also leave a mark on us. Um, and so you need to know what to do, to, mm -hmm. what to do. One of the things that I do in terms of my management of that is to have this conversation with the client where I, I, I have kind of what I've just said on, on a piece of paper um, that I give to them. And I just say like, you know, that's, 
um, th that's our way of ending and, and of us acknowledging the impact that we've had on each other. Um, so that's something that I've developed over time. But everybody has their own way of managing kind of, you know, endings with, with clients and things like that. Um, but I think there has to be an acknowledgement of it. You know, if you, if you, if you don't acknowledge it, then um, that's when it could, could become difficult. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. Yeah. That's a really nice way to end the interview. I want to end on that note. It's really nice. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time, honestly. I really, really appreciate it. Hi everyone, this is Deirdre here again. Thank you so much for listening to the episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please like, share and subscribe and follow at Road to Psychology on Instagram. Thanks again to Dr. Barber for coming on. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. Next week's episode will focus on organisational psychology. So if you have any questions, please send them on to me. Thanks again. Speak soon.